In this section of the lecture, we're going to look at protein metabolism just at a very basic level and thinking of some of the concepts of protein, um, of the metabolism of protein. As we start to think about protein metabolism, I think it's helpful to kind of have a reminder on what the basic categories of metabolism are. So remember, when we say metabolism, we're really looking at two different areas. Catabolism, which is the breakdown of some sort of product in the body, and anabolism, which is building up of something. So when we think about amino acids, the liver is really the primary place for amino acid metabolism. So the liver is able to take the amino acids that we have in the body, break them up, and reform them into uh, amino acids or proteins or different um, components that our body needs, different molecules, different substances that our body needs. So I think keeping that in mind, remembering it's the breakdown and the building back up helps when we think about uh, protein and amino acid metabolism. In thinking about protein and amino acid metabolism, we can kind of think about how protein comes into the body. So remember when we eat protein, it's going to come in in some form of the right tool here, some form of a, a protein that's basically just, a, that is a long chain of various amino acids. So my little AAs here are representing the amino, amino acids in a protein that we would eat from food. So then once it comes into the body, our um, body doesn't necessarily it need that protein in that form. It needs protein in some other form. So it might need protein for making immunoglobulins for the immune system, or it might need it for making lipoprotein proteins to transport lipids around the body. So the various uses of the amino acids are going to depend what the body does with it. But essentially, once it comes into the body, the liver is really, again, where the primary um, amino acid metabolism happens. So the, the amino acids are going to be broken apart. And then either the amino acid as a whole is going to be used, or remember kind of our basic structure of each amino acids, we have the amine group, uh, this, that central carbon, and then the carboxyl group, and then the side chain represented by the R is what makes each amino acid unique. And so depending what the body needs, it may use this amino acid as a whole, or it may break it further apart and use, for example, the nitrogen for something that it needs nitrogen for. Remember, protein is the only thing that we eat that has nitrogen in it, so this is where our body can get that nitrogen. Depending on the characteristics of the side group, it, the body might need that for something different. If it's a basic or acidic side group, that might be used, um, for example, a basic side group as a buffer in the body. It may be, if it's an aromatic or a branch chain amino acid, it would be used for functionality that needs that. So just as we think about that metabolism, think about, remember that proteins come into the body as these long chains of amino acids, but then our body really has to catabolize it, so break that down into smaller component parts so we get the different elements that we need, and then via anabolism builds back up what it actually does need, like immunoglobulins or lipoproteins or hemoglobin or you know whatever other kinds of protein the body needs. So in some of the metabolic processes, when the body's in the you know, process of taking what, what the food we ate and the amino acids from that food we, we ate and turning it into what we actually need, the removal or movement of um, parts are referred to transamination and deamination particularly removal of that amino group. So transamination is when there's a transfer of an amino group from one amino acid to an amino acid carbon skeleton or the alpha keto acid. Um, and this is catalyzed by amino transferases. So that's when it's, again, moving that amino group. If we want to completely remove the amino group, that's called deamination. And that would be uh, catalyzed by a deaminase. So there's several enzymes that work as deaminases. Um, for example, glutamate dehydrogenase is one. So these are different ways that the body can move, either take off completely or move that amino group from the amino acid. 
So in this image here, I just wanted to point out a few things. Basically, this is kind of showing, um, emphasizing that the liver is where this metabolic process is happening. So we're really starting out with this ammonia here. So remember when an amino acid is deaminated, the nitrogen or amine group is removed and that's converted into ammonia. We can only have so much ammonia in our blood or it becomes toxic. So our body can't handle too much ammonia in the blood. So we have to have some way to metabolize and get rid of it. So that's one thing that this kind of is illustrating is how the ammonia um, moves forward into the urea cycle. And the urea cycle is really what's going to... Um, convert that ammonia into urea so our body can excrete it, so it can be excreted by the kidneys. So just, you don't have to know all of the details of this, but kind of looking where some of those amino acids come into play and how this happens in the body. The other thing to look at in this image is how the urea cycle and the TCA or the Krebs cycle is are interrelated. So you'll remember from uh, basic metabolism, the Krebs cycle is really the core of energy metabolism. So you can kind of see how all of this comes comes together. Again, there are several amino acids in the red boxes on this page that help highlight the role they have with this. So a couple other things that I want to point out with this image in regard to thinking about it in terms of health um, and nutrition and those sorts of things is thinking about lab values, for example. So when we look at someone's blood and look at different components in their blood, one thing we can look at is blood urea nitrogen. So that's really indicating how much of this um, ammonia has been converted over to urea and how much of that is floating around in the blood. So I mentioned that the urea, all of this process here on the screen happens in the liver, and then the kidneys are what actually excretes that urea. So if someone has an elevated blood urea nitrogen, or BUN is often abbreviated, B-U-N, um, if that's elevated, we know that the liver made the urea, but we the kidneys weren't able to excrete it. So that often would indicate that something is going on with the kidneys, that they're not excreting it. Now on the other hand, if we had an elevated ammonia level in the blood, we may, that may indicate that something's going on actually in the liver that didn't allow this conversion to, from ammonia to urea to happen in the first place. So when we look at different blood values in, of different components in the blood and think about that in terms of health and disease, it kind of helps us if we can remember where these metabolic processes happen because that will help us know what organ is potentially being affected and we can tell that because of what's building up in the blood. So in just an overview again, kind of, of that catabolism portion of amino acids, so breaking down into other things, the amino acids um, that we start out with, again, are converted into that um, amine group, broken down into the amine group, the carbon skeleton, or the alpha keto acid. And then that skeleton can be used for either energy or we can make glucose, um, make ketone bodies, produce cholesterol, produce fatty acids, or a portion of that. And so basically what we just talked about is that the body can take what we eat, break it down, tear it apart, and then turn it into what we actually need. So again, what the particular amino acid will be used for really depends on what the body needs and what it can do with that particular amino acid. And what it can do with it depends on the structure and the characteristics of the side group of that individual amino acid. So whether it's acidic or basic, whether it's a branch chain amino acid or an aromatic amino acid, or all of those types of things decide, um, determine what, what kinds of proteins it can make or what kinds of functions it can have in the body. Um, so remember, proteins are used to make their enzymes, so digestive enzymes, hormones, nucleotides, structural proteins, all kinds of things that we need different proteins in different forms in the body. The other thing with the amino acids is thinking about sometimes the, the very specific amino acid is used in a particular way. 
Glutamine is one example. Glutamine is the primary energy source from for intestinal cells, so for enterocytes. So our body needs adequate glutamine in order to fuel the enterocytes and maintain the integrity of the gut. So maintain the cells inside the gut, which allow for efficient uh, absorption of nutrients. So all of all of the uses of the amino acid depends on what the body needs and what it can use that particular amino acid for. This graphic is another one that you certainly don't need to memorize any details of it, but I like it because I think it shows how a lot of the different amino acids help form some of the compounds that we may be familiar with. So just to highlight a few, think about histamine. So we know histamine is involved in an immune response when we have some sort of um, you know, even reaction to something, and those histamines cause the nose to run, and those sorts of things. So histidine is an important amino acid in forming histamines. Think about um, serotonin and melatonin. So remember, melatonin involved in sleep, serotonin involved in our, our mood, and those sorts of things. Tryptophan is a key amino acid involved in the production of those. A few others to highlight that we might not think about down at the bottom, thyroid hormones. So we know thyroid hormones are essential for energy metabolism, and we can see both tyrosine and phenylalanine are important in forming um, adequate thyroid hormones. So those are just a few examples. And of course, there are thousands and thousands of different examples we could put on the screen, but, but I think it's helpful to remember this is where the amino acids come into play, and there's specific amino acids that, that are used for the metabolic pathways to, to produce these other proteins and compounds that our body needs to function properly. So then what happens when things go wrong? So there are metabolic disorders out there related to protein metabolism that cause our body not to be able to break things down or build things up. Generally, the biggest issue is breaking things down um, properly. So one classic nutrition example is um, phenylketonuria, where our body is unable to break down phenylalanine. So there's no conversion of the phenylalanine to the tyrosine, which causes that phenylalanine to build up. And if that continues to build up, that can cause very severe health consequences, including mental retardation. So it's, um, it's a big issue. And really the, um, the only cure at this point is to limit the protein or the phenylalanine in the diet. So our body needs a, a certain amount, so we have to have some, but it's strictly, strictly limited um, in people with PKU, which is why you see on labels when something has phenyl phenylalanine in it, that that's clearly indicated on the label because um, it's a relatively, you know, relatively common disorder. Um, one in 10,000. I mean, you know, that doesn't sort of seem like a lot, but in, in the big picture of things, it's rel relatively common. Another example is this homocysteinuria. So again, just another example of a metabolic disorder that doesn't allow us to break down amino acids um, how we should. And um, this one is the uh, de defects basically in this uh, synthase compound that causes um, homocysteine to build up in the blood. And we know elevated levels of homocysteine can be problematic. And in this disorder, it gets really high. And so a diet low in methionine, um, added cysteine, and then supplements of betaine and folate are what's done uh, for that disorder. So um, phenylal phenylalanine, PKU, phenylketonuria, the um, metabolic disorder associated with not breaking down phenylalanine, phenylalanine is a very classic nutrition example, so that would be a good one to be familiar with. But the other examples here and in the textbook, you don't have to memorize the details of the disorders, but kind of keeping in mind how that works metabolically and why that would be a problem. So in terms of amino acids in the plasma or what's kind of available in our body, um, plasma concentrations of amino acid rise after a meal. So after we eat, our body breaks that down um, into amino acids, and so the plasma concentration rises. There is a pool of about 150 grams of endogenous plus exogenous amino acids, and basically it's thought that the primary source is the reuse of amino acids that are there for protein synthesis. 
So our body doesn't really have a huge storage capacity for amino acids. We have our muscles, which are made of protein, and different, you know, the heart's made of protein, organs, things like that are made of protein. But obviously we don't want to be tapping into those to use those amino acids. So our body does have some in a pool, but it's not a tremendous amount. So we do need to be eating proteins uh, regularly in order to replenish that. But, but there is, you know, is some what of a pool. There is more non-essential than essential amino acids within that pool. So this just to kind of say, yes, we have some floating around, um, but not a huge tremendous amount. So just a couple of summary highlight points sort of from a nutrition perspective um, when we think about protein metabolism. And again, this is just kind of the basic, but to help you really think about how to put this in perspective. So we take in protein from food. So we eat food sources of protein. Our body then breaks that down into the smaller compounds, whether that be uh, amino acid or breaks it down commonly even further than that into the, the carbon skeleton, the, the nitrogen, which then can, the amine group converts that to ammonia or uses the nitrogen for other products um, and then uses the components of the side chain for different functions in the body. So our body breaks that down and then reforms, um, puts it all back together into different structures for whatever it needs. And again, the different amino acids are utilized for different functions. And remembering back to when we talked about protein structure, that the structure and the characteristics of each individual amino acid are going to dictate what it's able to be used for in the body.